Chapter Five of Stories of Old Greece and Rome by Emily Kip Baker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five, Apollo and King Admetus. There would have been but little trouble between Jupiter and his stately wife if no one but Minerva ever gave the watchful Juno cause for jealousy, but other goddesses and even mortal maidens found favour in the eyes of Jupiter, and for their sake he often left her side. From his throne in the high heavens the ruler of the world saw not only the goddesses, with their glory of immortal youth, but also the daughters of men, endowed with that same beauty and grace which the gods themselves had bestowed upon the first woman. Though Juno, of the snow-white arms, alone enjoyed the title of Queen of Heaven, she knew that she had many rivals for the love of Jupiter, and it was this jealousy of all loveliness in women that made her ever watchful and revengeful. Perhaps it was the cause, too, of the very changeable temper that her husband accused her of possessing. Whoever won the affections of Jupiter was sure to be persecuted by cruel Juno's unrelenting hate, as the poet Virgil says, but this did not hinder the ruler of the gods from leaving very often the marble halls of Olympus to wander in some disguise about the earth. It was after such an absence that the watchful Juno learned of Jupiter's love for fair-haired Latona, goddess of dark nights. As this new rival was not a mortal maiden who could be punished with death, the wrathful queen was forced to be content with banishing the goddess for ever from Olympus, and compelling her to live upon the earth. Not satisfied with this, she decreed that any one who took pity on the unhappy goddess, or gave her any help, would incur the lasting displeasure of Juno. For days and nights Latona wandered, not daring to ask for food or shelter, since all men knew of Juno's decree. She slept at night in some spot where the trees offered protection from wind and rain, and her only food was the scanty store that she could gather by the way, berries, nuts, wild honey, and sometimes bits of bread dropped by children in their play. One day, being very thirsty, she stopped beside a clear pool to drink, but some reapers who were passing by saw her, and hoping to gain favour with Juno, they stepped into the pool and stirred up the water into such muddiness that poor Latona could not drink. Angered by such uncalled-for cruelty, the goddess prayed to Jupiter that these wicked men might never leave the spot where they were standing. Jupiter, from his throne in the high heavens, heard her prayer, and in answer he turned the reapers into ugly green frogs, and bade them stay for ever in the muddy pool. And ever afterwards, when men came upon slimy ponds, where rank weeds grew and the water oozed from muddy banks, there they found the blinking frogs, even as Jupiter had willed. After wandering some miles further, Latona came at last to the seashore, and here she begged Neptune, the god who shakes the shores, to come to her aid, for she knew that Juno's power did not extend to the ruler of the sea. Seeing her distress, and pitying the poor persecuted goddess, Neptune sent her a dolphin, who took her on his back, and swam with her to the floating island of Delos, which the kindly sea-god had caused to appear out of the depth of the ocean. Here Latona landed, and was for a time content, but the rocking of the island soon grew unbearable, and she begged the aid of Neptune a second time. He obligingly chained the island to the bottom of the Aegean Sea, and Latona had no further cause for complaint. On this island were born her two children, Apollo, god of the sun, and Diana, goddess of the moon. When the children were grown, Jupiter took them to Olympus, though not without much protest from the ever-jealous Juno. The young Apollo's beauty and his skill in music gained him great favour among the gods, and found him worshippers in every town and city throughout the land of Greece. So conscious of his power did Apollo become, that he sometimes dared to assert his authority, unmindful of the will of Jupiter, and on one occasion he so angered his divine parent that he was banished to the earth, and made to serve Admetus, king of Thessaly. In spite of his disgrace, Apollo managed to cheer his lonely hours of labour with his music, and, as his work was no more difficult than to care for the king's sheep, he had abundant leisure to play upon his lyre, while his flocks grazed on the sunny hillsides. As soon as he touched the strings, 
all the wild things in the forest crept out to hear. The fox came slinking from his hole among the rocks, and the timid deer drew close to the player and stayed beside him listening. The strains of the wonderful music were carried across the meadows, and the mowers stopped their work, wondering where the player might be. One day they brought word to the king that some god must be among them, for no mortal could produce such music as they had heard. So Admetus sent for the shepherd, and when the youth stood before him, he marvelled at his great beauty, and still more at the golden lyre that Apollo held in his hand. Then, when the young musician, in obedience to the king's command, began to play, all those who heard him were filled with wonder, and felt sure that a god had come to dwell among them. But Admetus asked no questions, only made the youth his head shepherd, and treated him with all kindness. Though a god, and no true shepherd, Apollo served the king faithfully, and when at last his time of service was over, and Jupiter called him back to Olympus, Apollo, wishing to show some favour in return for the king's kindness, begged for Admetus the gift of immortality. This request the wise Jupiter granted, but only on the condition that when the time came for the king to die, some one could be found to take his place. Apollo agreed to these terms, and Admetus, knowing the conditions on which the gift was made, accepted his immortality gladly. For a time all went well, but the inevitable hour came when the fates decreed that Admetus's life was ended, and that he must go the way of all mortals, unless someone would die in his stead. The king was much beloved by his people, but no one's devotion to his sovereign was great enough to inspire him to make the needed sacrifice. Then Alcestis, beautiful wife of Admetus, learned of the price that must be paid for her husband's immortality, and gladly offered her life in exchange for the king's. So, in all her young grace and beauty, she went down into the dark region of Hades, where no sunlight ever came, and where her joyous laughter was for ever hushed in the silence that reigns among the dead. Thus Admetus gained immortality, but his happiness was too dearly bought, for as the days went by he mourned more and more for his beautiful young wife, and in his dreams he saw her walking like a shadow among the grim shapes that move noiselessly in the silent halls of death. Bitterly he repented of his selfishness in accepting the sacrifice of her life, and his immortality grew hateful to him, since each day only added to his sorrow. So he prayed to Apollo to recall his gift, and to give him back his wife Alcestis. It was not in the power of that god to change a decree of Jupiter's, but the ruler of all things looked down from the heaven, and, seeing the great grief and remorse of Admetus, he withdrew the gift that had cost the king so dear, and sent Hercules to the kingdom of Pluto, with commands to let Alcestis go. Very gladly the god carried this message to the gloomy realm of Hades, where, amid the myriad shadow-shapes, he sought and found Alcestis, and out of the dreadful darkness in which she walked alone, Hercules led her back to earth again. End of chapter 5